Hi, I'm Karen Jenkins Johnson, Principal of Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco and New York. Thank you for joining us on the first uh, Friday of autumn. M my team and I hope that you're healthy, safe, and well during these very challenging times. We welcome you to our 17th conversation on culture, a discussion with artists, curators, and collectors on current art world topics. Today, I'm happy to be in conversation with gallery artist Wissam al -Badri. Before we begin, begin today's conversation, um, we want to acknowledge at Jenkins Johnson Gallery the passing of Supreme Court Justice, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We thank her for giving all she had, for being advocate for women's rights and for transforming the roles of men and women in American society. As a woman of color, a working mother, a mother of a transgender child, and the wife of a black man, Thank you, RGP. May you rest in peace. Today, we're proud to be in conversation with a storyteller who continues to bring attention to the underserved and current um, and uh, the underserved and current uh, world topics. Wassam Al Badri. Wassam was born in southern Iraq and relocated to the United States after living in a refugee camp for four and a half years. He bore witness to the Iraq and Iran, Iran War, the Gulf War, and the uprising in Iraq. He currently lives and works in the Bay Area. Wassam al Badri is an investigative multimedia journalist, interdisciplinary artist, working mainly with themes related to identity, labor, migration, Islamophobia, war, and technology. His work focuses on the Middle East and the North African diaspora, specifically the region's representation of popular culture in the media. Wassam has a master's in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. Hey, Bay Area. Al, Al Badri has worked <laughs> for global media outlets, including CNN and Al Jazeera America. His photographs have been found in the New York Times, Rolling Stone Magazine, The Atlantic, and Mother Jones. Wassam has received several awards, including the John Collier Jr. Award for Still Photography, the Dorothea Lang Fellowship, the Jim Marshall Fellowship for Photography, and the National Geographic Society Fellowship. His work has exhibited at museums, including the De Young Museum, um, which is part of the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco, museums in um, Frankfurt, Germany, and the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City. He's particip participated in several um, group exhibitions and galleries around the world. He has an upcoming solo exhibition at Jenkins Johnson Gallery opening October 12th. Wassam is represented by Jenkins Johnson Gallery both in San Francisco and New York. Welcome Wassam. Hi Karen, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the beautiful introduction. And hi to everybody. I can't see y'all, but I'm super excited to share my two projects with you. And thank you so much for carving the time to have to hear us talk about culture. So thank you. I uh, I also want to mention that Wassam is married to beautiful Malia, and they are expecting their first child this fall. Congratulations. Thank you. So Wassam has several series, uh, uh, including the famous Alcator that was a part of contemporary Muslim fashion that traveled throughout the world. But today we're gonna to discuss his two recent, his newest series. The Migrant Workers, uh, primarily focused here in California, and then the Appalachia series, also known as the Mariana series. So let's get started. Can you please tell us a little bit about um, Wassam, your life and how you came, came from Iraq to the United States? Yeah, well, it's um, it's a beautiful journey um, to me, you know. So, so um, I was born in '84. I'm in a southern small town in Iraq, you know. Um, in the march is pretty much not Syria, and um, in like 1991, um, Iraq committed atrocity by invading Kuwait, and um, there, so there was um, our people were oppressed for so long and my family, you know, we lived in extreme poverty and extreme paranoia because of, you know, the Iraqi military. So what happened, um, we, my mom actually decided that my father already left the country and my mom had um, five 
I know there was five of us at that time and um, she just had a newborn baby, Shams, now she's um, 29. And um, she decided to flee the country on foot. And, you know, she tried multiple times. And, um, you know, on the third time we got lucky and we crossed borders and we got into Saudi Arabia. Um, that's where they established a refugee camp. But we didn't know it was a refugee camp for the first two years because Saudi Arabia does not take refugees. So it was considered a prison of war camp. Um, then after that, actually, the UN and other countries put pressure to take us in as refugees. So all my life, you know, um, I owe it all to my mother raised by a single woman, you know, so, and um, that's how I got to Nebraska. We got picked by a lottery. They actually, you know, just like they pick numbers and we had to go through the interview process and, you know, was, it was really grilling. And we finally moved to the Midwest and I grew up in Nebraska. Um, so that's the short story of a long piece, you know, to tell. So. Yeah. Well, you know, while you're doing it, what's the difference between a refugee and an immigrant? Well, um, an immigrant sometimes, a lot of it, like right now it's getting blurred, but a lot of immigrants sometimes is people who migrate from their homes due to like climate or due to like to seek, you know, um, a better opportunity to, or to seek jobs. Refugees is actually like a lot of time is like our homes were attacked or there was like an ethnic cleansing, there is a genocide, there is all of these things. So we actually end up running away or fleeing our countries due to wars. So, um, but now, you know, the term is getting broader because now there's climate refugees, you know, um, there's like, so in the nineties, it was like defined in like little groups, but now, you know, that the world getting more global and these um, global issues are becoming, you know, prominent. So there's like, you know, climate refugees, war refugees, um, even like discrimination refugees, you know, against the LGBTQ communities, if, if, if they're in the Middle East or Africa or even Latin America, people are taking, you know, refuge in other places. So. So how has your time in the refugee camp and being a refugee framed your practice? Well, um, so, uh, you know, entering a refugee camp as a kid, you really don't understand, you know. Um, so when I was seven years old, when I entered the refugee camp, I already had scars of war, you know, physically and mentally on my body, right? Like, so when I entered it, it was still a safe place for me not to be in a war zone. Um, so when you get there, you don't really grasp the, what is PTSD, right? Like we didn't even know that term existed. I mean, I didn't get introduced to it till I was in my late twenties um, because, you know, you think it was just the norm of life. That's how life is. Yeah. Um, and what happened is when I entered the refugee camp, is like I fell in love with um, journalism, right? Because um, I really wanted to be a, um, a writer as a young kid. So I, you know, we lived in tents and, you know, so sometimes people say to me, oh, you live in a small space. I was like, there were seven of us living in a space for four and a half years. So, you know, sometimes it's like, you just gotta love one another. And um, so with that is that it really shaped my, multiple things in my life. One is my love for journalism and telling stories, but also how journalism view us as the other on the other end of the lens, right? Like I was one of those kids with a runny nose and a big old head, you know, with no shoes on. That was me. Um, and I really, there was more to me than that one day when they captured me in that image, you know? And, but at the same time is I didn't understand the whole graph of um, representation, right? Like. And, and sometimes is when your people have been represented in the news for so long in that image or manner, you really don't know other, right? Like till you get introduced to other people who face the struggle, if it's in South Africa or in the United States or in Latin America, and you, and you understand, you know, the representation of African Americans in the media, Native Americans, LGBTQ people, then you start realizing like, hey, you know, I knew I had a feeling how we've been represented in the media for so long now there is this, you know, other people who experienced it and fought back or fighting back. And maybe we should have a voice as how I want to represent people or present people in my work. Um, so that was one. And I think two is a community is very important to me or, or, or respecting people. Um, and a lot of my work is when I approach people, I literally approach the story is how I would photograph my own family, my own friends, and I, I will always be held responsible for my work. And what I mean by that, um, I always give people my contact information. I always, because, you know, I don't want people to feel like um, 
I'm exploiting or taking advantage of them. So there's this always this mutual understanding. Like I tell people what I'm here to do, what my work is about, um, because I don't want them to ever be surprised. And I don't ever want to do people wrong. Like, um, and I have great relationships. Like um, I worked all across the United States. So my work mostly focuses in the United States. Um, I have worked um, like, you know, Appalachia, um, the border of US and Mexico and the Rio Grande Valley years back. Um, I worked um, on native reservations for the past 11 years, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, I worked um, in Detroit with Arab communities, um, in Mississippi, the lower Delta, and, and you built friendships over the years, um, even though the story is, you know, been published or the story is done, but you, you, you create these long, lifelong friendships with people. And I think when you approach people with empathy, respect, and how you want to be in their place, if somebody going to show a photograph of you, then you, you have, you know, something is working there. Yeah. Um, you just don't take a photo and just leave and like, you know, um, because, you know, images with the digital age can exist forever. And, and then if they're on a pigment print, you know, they can exist, but only certain people can see those or have, you know, access to that. Um, so to me, it's very important how I uh, present people. And because I always want, I bring it back to me. Yes. So taking that with some and expanding on that, let's, let's look at your migrant workers. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, is there an image you like Rachel to bring up? No, we can start with them. I think so. Um, with this, this is a, a massive body of work. Um, so when I was, um, you know, leaving the program at, at UC Berkeley School of Journalism, as I was given an opportunity um, to work on a story beside, uh, Appalachia was my original story, but due to COVID, um, I couldn't really travel. So at that time, um, National Geographic Society was giving out grants to, um, to journalists or documentary photographers to do story. And I was lucky enough to be a recipient um, to, to, to do this work. So I originally started the story as any new story. Um, well, if I backtrack, so you investigate the story, you find what the issues are, you find the locations, you, you, and you wanna start building on it. But I, I take a, usually a different approach. And my different approach is I find the workers who are working in the field and I reach out to them directly. Um, so I'm not really interested in reaching out to the, um, to the farmer or the grower first. I reach out to the people um, who work in the field. And because of that, I, I, the reason like to me is because I worked in big pack and plants and pack and plants for 10 years of my life as a young person when I moved to the US. So to me, it's like I have a lot um, to relate to or um, a lot in common with the field workers, with people who actually do in the labor. Um, and that's how I get access to these places is actually the workers take me in themselves. So, you know, it's, it's usually journalists go to the company and the company grant them access and, you know, and by granting them access, they dictate how you photograph and how they want their image to be, um, you know, to be presented to the, to the general public. But my way is no, I actually go to the people directly to the people working in the field and, um, and people can read you, you know, people are like, sometimes we think you're clever. No, people, people can know if you're genuine or if you're, um, you know, if you're, um, sincere about what you want to say. And there's always this source of negotiation because a lot of workers are not documented. Um, a lot of workers are living in mixed, um, mixed um, status households. And what that means is that a parent can have a green card, but the children don't, or the kids were born here, but the parents are not, uh, parents are not um, they don't have documentation. And throughout the series, I can, pull, you know, we can talk about certain images of which ones like, and, and, um, and to me, that's something I always tell people. I'm not here to bring you harm. I'm not here. I'm just here to tell your story. And I would like to, you know, and people feel comfortable. And when you spend more than 20 minutes to an hour, you know, you have lunch, you work in the field, you, people want to know about your life story. And to sometimes a lot of people like all over this country, when they find out I'm from Iraq and doing this work to them, it's more as, as, as fascinating to them as I am as they are to me, right? They're like, you're from Iraq and why you're here? And why do you do this work? And how did you decide to, you know, like people are curious. And I think through, the, through that curiosity, you build these, you know, those moments, um, these beautiful moments, because then those moments then help me be introduced to other workers, right? Because people are like, well, you should talk to my other friend or you should come to my house later on. And that's how usually I, I, I always worked. Um, I don't like, 
I don't see people in my work as subjects. I have a problem with that term. I, I always, um, because you know, that, that strips people away from agency, yes. right? Like that, that strip them away from their dignity and their, you know, I could, like I work with people and that's my whole thing. Like if I work with people, why can't I say I work with people, you know? And I always like treat people as people. I don't treat them as a subject for my story. That's important, right? While it's either a one day turnaround or two day turnaround journalism story or a long form documentary project or even in my art. It's like I work with actual people who, who have loved ones, who have, um, you know, a favorite meal, who have a favorite movie. So I'm not going to strip them to that single image and not know enough about them to carry out, you know, to be, if I get a question, who is this person? I'm not, I'm not aware, like, I'm not um, informed to say, well, here's the story about this image. Um, so I always been very critical of journalism in this fact of um, even though I'm a journalist, but you have to be critical of your field when people say, oh, we, can you photograph the subject? And I usually say, uh, you mean these people? Right. You know? And right. so, and the whole migrant worker series going like to it, um, I, I call them farm workers and, um, and um they're really like it just happened you know i showed up i introduced myself i talked to a few people then a few people said talk to this organization and this organization that worked directly with people who um help like um farm workers find like legal housing get legal status or even help them get out of ice detention centers then through that you know then I meet, you know, um, farm workers who just got out of ICE detention centers, you know, um, because of COVID and they tell you their story. And, and I, that's what I wanted to tell. Like, yeah, this image right here of freaking um, pause on it. Um, this person was really reluctant to speak with me in the beginning, but I was like, well, would you like to um, meet with me and um, have a conversation, you know, and the conversation went like, you know, look, I, I really want to tell your story. I think it's a very powerful story. I respect you, you know, as a person and your struggle. And I tell them a little bit about me and I say, what do you feel comfortable? If you, if you are part of this project, how would you feel comfortable being presented? Um, you know, like, um, and, and they usually just, you know, easily say to me that, um, look, I feel comfortable if you record my voice and which is, this is a multimedia project as well. Um, they're video portraits and you get to actually hear this person speak. Um, and, and I, w what I would do is then, um, I really just, you know, have them give me the time and the, I listen, um, because I'm there to listen. Right. And, and, and a lot of people have this thing that I'm giving them a voice. No, no, I'm not giving nobody a voice. Everybody have a voice. We just don't listen. You see, people have a voice. It just, we choose not to listen to them. And my whole thing is, I just want to bring these stories for people to listen to, um, and that's the practice in my work. Can you, can you, uh, the, the, the American, you, the piece that you call uh, the all American. Uh, um, oh, yeah. the American dream. American. Yeah. Yeah. The American dream. Well, yeah. what happened is this, yes. with this work is um, a lot of farm workers. So I want to get very few things very clear. Um, a lot of farm workers don't get health care. A lot of farm workers don't get overtime pay or unemployment for that. Um, or social security if that, so they have to work till they, I mean, like there's portraits of people I have, they work till they're 78 years old, 76 years old. Um, and be, due to their legal status, right? Like, and that's a very complicated situation. And there is the fear, uh, or repercussion of, um, you know, them missing work. So this gentleman is in his like little mid sixties still working when he came here, when he was 20 some years old, he's oh. still picking. And like, and to me, that image sums up a lot of things when like, he's always pick, like, he's always contributing to the society. He's always contributing. He, they do like farm workers do pay taxes, you know, like, I mean, that's very clear, but they don't get a lot of that benefits back. Like when, um, when the, 20, the stimulus check came in, a lot of workers couldn't get it. Then the California governor um, said, we will help. But a lot of people are afraid to go through those systems because more than one, than one time, I pretended, set up, you know, to get people. So, but this image sums it all to me. Like this man works to feed America every day. Like, you know, he, he, he works with 
hundreds of thousands of other farm workers that work every day to feed America. And his hat, you know, his hat, like his, this whole idea of, of the American dream and like, and he's just reaching for that. But like, you know, it's always in sight, but it's so far away. And what I mean by so far away is that because America is not giving him that opportunity to be part of that, you know, um, when it comes to fair labor laws or, or housing laws or all of that. You know, um, so that's what that image spoke a lot to me. I mean, I can keep talking about it, but sometimes yeah. just I, just showing it is enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the workers and how they're paid? Um, so uh, so um, in, in this image, for an example, workers get paid. Um, so there's a foreman on there. Um, so there's a hierarchy how it breaks down. Um, so the workers get paid per per basket in this situation. And in the tangerine fields, they get paid per bag. So like, let's say if he falls a 30 pound um, basket, that's like $2.50 per that. So you go to the store and you pay per pound $2.50. He's getting paid $2.50 for 30 pounds. Um, in the sense of tangerine bags, they're 30 pounds to 40 pounds. And there's a lot of people like in the mid 60s you know, working in those, going up them 10 foot ladders, 11 foot ladders up and down. They would run circles around me, you know, with these bags and they have, and they get paid 250 per bag and they have to fill a crate of 500 pounds, you know, to get paid. And like sometimes um, some of the images actually um, workers. Yeah. So that's a bag. So there's three pound bags and there's 40 pounds bag. And this bags is his livelihood because there's a person standing there every, like the whole time and they just keep marking how many bags you fill per day. Um, and there's some fields that I walked onto that like broccoli field or um, artichoke fields. They get paid to clear out a field. Um, I, it was my last assignment for Mother Jones. The work is not out yet. And um, we went to the field and I talked to the worker. The, he, you know, the, the supervisor saw me like, you know, standing there and they're like, who's this strange person? So I walk slowly and I introduce myself and I say, look, I'm a photographer. I'm working on this story. Um, would you be okay for me to be, um, to, to be on the field? So it was a night image um, and um, it's not in the series here. It's gonna be, hopefully be out soon. And, um, and he said, well, you can photograph. And, um, and I said, well, how many boxes do you do? He said, we do 20, th uh, no, 20, no, 24 um, lettuce heads in a box and we do about a thousand boxes. So that's 24,000 lettuce heads, a group of 10 people fill in at one night in King City. Then that group, then he supervises three groups and they have to clean out a field. That's how they get paid. Then it get divided between them. So there is the bag. Um, the only time people get paid hourly, sometimes it depends on if they're working packing plants. But if you're working in the fields, it's, it's always, um, there's images we have of garlic pickers during the fires. They were getting paid $2 per five gallon bucket of garlic. Now you imagine when you go to Whole Foods, how much you pay. And, the, and these groceries are going to actually like a lot of respected grocery chains, organic, you know, um, like big ones. So, so it's, it's in a grocery store near you, literally, you know, that's where it comes from. Like yes. it's a solid bowl of America. That's what Salinas Valley is. So that's a tangerine um, field. Tangerine field. And, and how do the um, how do the children fit into all this? Well, the child is a complicated situation due to COVID because before a lot of parents relied on the school system, you know, um, not like free daycare, but they relied to get their children educated, right? Um, and what happened is now kids have to stay home. So a lot of kids are 14 or 13 are babysitting their other siblings while their parents have to work. Um, and parents cannot really afford to lose work because of the fact is they will be evicted. There is a rent monitorium right now about evictions, but uh, yeah, in this image right here, this family live in a labor camp, mm -hmm. a farm labor camp. Um, and this was the actual first family I made contact with, uh, like introduced myself and worked and, um, and like, you know, and she's actually holding over. She's actually evicted right now. Um, she got hurt on the field and she cannot work again. Um, her husband works every day um, laying alley, uh, irrigation pipes, 15 pipes, and he would do um, a half a mile field. Um, 
And his situation, he get paid hourly, right? Because you have to work in a field. Um, so, and they're actually evicted. So what she had a beautiful home and what happened now, basically what you see, you know, they just have a mattress that is five people living in that, two adults, three of her children and her sister, she have custody of living in this home. Um, and she's afraid because as soon as the court, courts open back up in Monterey County, the next big stories or the next big push is evictions. Um, because a lot of people have been holding over, but, you know, and there is um, an issue with housing in Monterey County. There are like 32,000 units in need wow. of housing, but they don't have it. And Salinas Valley is this, I mean, um, Central Valley is the same in a lot of ways. So there is a lot of that. Um, it's a complicated story how you do. Um, I love this image because um, I was... Um, you know, this little human have a little personality of their own. You know, I was standing there photographing and sometimes, you know, it's just a nod, this universal nod, like if people agree with you in a camera, because it's tricky to photograph children without family, you know, parents permission. Um, and, but it's always that nod, like when you look at the parents, you know, and you ask for permission to photograph and they give you that nod, then it's beautiful. But to me, this image sums up a lot of, like a lot of, agency in this little kid, you know what I mean? They had like their own little funk, you know? They, they're not like, they were not like, they didn't want to hear you, you know what I mean? Even the parents acknowledge that you're there and you're working. The little kids like this has had this beautiful thing to, to this image. And, and, uh, and it, the composition to me and the colors, those are always secondary, right? Like a lot of time, what, when we want to deconstruct images of minorities, we always talk about compositions and colors. We're always afraid to talk about what's what we're looking at, you know, and what we're seeing, we always go to the technical aspect, but we don't go to the actual person in the image. Um, and to me, that sums up a lot of the work is like farm workers do have a life outside of work. And, and I think that's the big problem that we, we see these people as, um, as only like working in the field, but they have no birthday parties, they have no homes, they have no, 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 no you know what I mean? No, like beautiful dinners. And I wanted, my idea was, no, I wanted to go into people's homes. Like my whole thing is like, okay, I did the journalism part, but now the documentary work and the artwork comes in and I want to go into people's homes now. I want to be in their space. I want to like, I want to see what it looks like. And, um, and that's what happened that the, the continuing of this project is I actually start going into people's homes and showing where they live, um, you know, and it's, a, it's an ongoing project um, going on. And this image is also, um, you know, same thing here. This young man, you know, is, is fighting to make his life a better place. But last time when I first met him to do the story for the New York Times with an amazing other, other journalist from the program, um, what happened is that he's working in the grape fields, you know? So sometimes like life and opportunities are not as the same as we think they are to other people or minority groups. Right, right. Um, this image is also of the couple, um, actually, um, it was a food, um, food program and, um, Delano to farm workers. So if you do, uh, the, there is miles, a mile or two of farm workers in line to get groceries. They can't afford the fruits they pick. Yeah. If that makes sense to you. There's a lot of food deserts. And what I mean by food deserts, they're like in this story in, um, in this little town that the only grocery store within like 40 mile radius is this little convenience store that it said it had fruits, but it was like old fruits, you know, it's cheaper to buy, to buy like food, you know, that's like filled with sugar. And I'm not judging nobody, please understand, like I grew up eating that food, you know, so I'm not saying like, but I'm saying like, we should afford the people the same opportunities they're picking. If they're picking the vegetables, they should be able to have the fruits and the vegetables they're picking. But there's a lot of laws against that. Um, Could you and, tell us a little bit about, Wassam, about you were telling us uh, how the picking happens and falls on the ground and then um, you how it happens. Yeah, you cannot pick it. So, so if you're picking tangerines, as soon as that tangerine hit the ground, the farm worker cannot take it home or they cannot it just sit there. Like it just, you know, um, if it's spinach, if it's broccoli, if it's anything, um, like, you know, if it, if, if it was cut from the tree or, or rooted from the plant from that and it hits the ground, they really cannot take it. It's considered contaminated and they just have to leave it behind. So a lot of, like a lot of times farm workers don't get to take the, vegetables they they pick home um 
and a lot of it, I mean, there's like thousands of pounds sometimes of spinach just laying across a field. Wow, that's deep. That's really troubling. Yeah, um, um, yeah but this image, is, it was also in Delano, um, and, and, and I started, after my brother's passing, I started paying attention to um, memorial, uh, memorial sites on the highway, like how do we honor our loved ones? And, um, and this image in particular, like you can see the Coke and the Sprite there. So people came like probably a few hours before us because when I got there, it still had the like little moist on top of it. And it's actually a parent of se uh, seven children, I believe. Um, I chased them down and they, f they crashed into that be the electric pole in the back because there is a ditch behind this directly and they crashed and passed away. So now they left seven orphans behind. Um, right now, ICE is not doing as much raids because of the, the considered essential workers, which the oh, farm workers have always been essential. Um, and now our love for farm workers, I hope that continues because we should be advocates, you know, for um, bringing change. And I think um, with this story in particular, these parents passed away and left seven children behind because of that. Um, in this image, a lot of farm workers cannot leave work, right? They're afraid to lose work. So even if they're sick, um, they can't leave work because they get paid, you know, per day. So if they don't make that payday, they don't, they can't support their family. So this is a hospital actually um, in Salinas Valley or um, in Salinas, the city of Salinas, and they made a command center. They call it a command center. And basically there's um, multiple languages, indigenous language and besides Spanish and English. And people can call in with their symptoms um, because people are afraid to show up to hospital because there is always the fear of ICE agents there outside catching you anywhere or, you know, police arresting you and, and handing you over to ICE. So farm workers sometimes call with their symptoms and if it's really like dire, they have to come in. Before there was a mobile unit that used to go to, um, to the fields and check on farm workers, but now they had to stop that since March because of COVID and funding. So um, before we get off of the migrant workers, because we're going to switch to the Appalachia, um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the migrant workers, workers before we go on? Um, is there something you'd like us to pull up, an image? I think um, this image for me, uh, like I, I'm, I'm really happy with this image. Um, and the reason is I'm saying that because um, I mean, not for the visual, but for because of this human being behind the image. Actually, she's a breast cancer survivor. Okay. Uh, and she's still in emission, right? But she's in the field, she's immunocompromised, but she shows up to work every day. And, um, and during the fires a few days ago, um, or the smoke, she actually, I was um, in the Midwest and she was sending me photographs and videos of them working in the field. So this work is really difficult. This work is not easy to do, um, but I wanted to photograph it in a beautiful way, right? I wanted to photograph people, how they see themselves. I wanted to, them like, you know, to have these images in their home as well as in other places, but an image they could be proud of to say, look, this is an image of me in this photograph. You know, it's not just like I was a subject for somebody's story, but not like, look at me. Right. So, and I'm like, you know, if anybody having a particular um, question they would like to ask or yes. something, I'm more than happy to answer it. So what, what photographer has influenced you, your work? Um, I'm going to switch to Appalachia now, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, photographers that influenced me, um, well, obviously, like, Gordon Parks is one of them. Um, you know, I was in high school and I, and, I, and I read his book, A Choice of Weapon, I believe, you know, um, and... Uh, I didn't understand what he was talking about because I was not that um, easy kid in high school, um, you know, so that was when um, Eugene Smith always been a very big um, influence on my life because I think sometimes um, humanity shows their work. Um, so those like one thing, um, obviously Ken Light been a very great mentor um, in my life um, and the Connor, you know, um, what do you call it? Like Darcy Padilla, Carlos actually is in your, you know, um, with you as well. So these people, I think the reason I, I named the living ones is because I can reach out to them, you know, and have a conversation. Um, I have like, so, you know, there's are always, um, there's always multiple other photographers. I mean, I have a whole trope, a library, but um, those are the ones that actually, like when I think of journalism and documentary, those are yeah. the ones that always come to mind because they worked on long-term projects. 
And, um, and one day when I met Ken Light for the first time, um, I said to him, I was like, look, you've done all the work I have done. You know what I mean? Like if I, worked, I worked in Appalachia, I worked in the South, I worked in prisons about women giving birth in prison. And you've done it like three, four decades before me. And he said, well, obviously we didn't stop the problem. It's on your generation now to continue that work. And I think that's something, you know, um, it's always like we always have to be preparing the next generation to continue this work. So I well, hope- I've been passed the torch and you're, you're running with it. And I think it's um, not only you doing migrant workers. I mean, there's several other series. I mean, when I talk to Wassam, it's always um, interesting to see what he's doing because he's usually doing 10, 12 things at one time. And I'm like, Wassam, we got we to gotta focus here. <laughs> And um, so, but one of the things that uh, the series that you started uh, last in, in 2019 was the Appalachia. Can you tell where Appalachia and why you chose that and what, what are you doing with this particular series? Yes. Um, so originally when I started this project, I was working for Al Jazeera America about nine years ago or eight years ago. Um, and I was one of the producers. I, so I found the story, then another team, like part of the group, went and worked on it. And it was in a town of, of, of about 30 miles away from Mariana, Heidelberg. And, um, but we did a story about this old lady that was, she's now 87. So I met her when, yeah, I met her when she's like 79. And, um, and she was the last holdout of this little small town against this Lowell mining. And basically they just mine under your ground. So what happened in a lot of times in Appalachia, um, while it's mining or while it's um, fracking, you can own the land, but you don't own the mineral, mineral rights underneath that land. Wow. So that's how it works, right? So, and, um, and I can go into detail a lot. Uh, so with mining, they just dig under your house and over time it just shifts. So they destroy the creeks, they destroy the rivers underneath, they destroy everything. So your house was slow. So they use this tactic, they'll buy my home, your home, and they leave the other person home. So the value drops, um, uh, services don't get provided anymore and they just leave that home. You know, so the, so that person actually still holding out. I mean, her whole neighborhood is gone and like, Last summer when I was there, we got we got to see each other and, and her house still looks the same. Uh, she's still holding on to just her and her son. Um, but with Mariana, what made it special is that when you're working in Appalachia, like Mariana have the second largest like um, fracking, right? Like, you know, um, wells in the like in Pennsylvania or even in the country. And a lot of these companies, yeah, if we can pause on this for a second, uh, a lot of these companies come from Texas you know, to frack. Um, and basically they promise jobs. They don't bring jobs. They have their own crews and their own crews come and they specialize in this. And the way it works like this. So this is on this lady's land, right? But they're not extracting the gas underneath her land. They can dig a pipe a mile or half a mile away from her land and extract underneath your property. So that's how they get, you know, um, and so they, they call, you know, these pads are all over. And there is like little pads and there is like, this one has one well and there's like super pads that would have eight wells. And there's like pads that would have 16 wells. But then there's the problem is now, um, and it's all going to a crocker plant where they make plastic with this. Um, they, they promise um, a lot of these people, you know, in the beginning there was this term called shellionaires. You know, Shell, uh, Marcella Shell gas came into this neighborhood and like they start digging and they promise people you would become a millionaire if we dig on your property and we're gonna pay you. Well, that's not true because the price of gas differ, you know, goes up and down, right? So you get paid whatever it is, but sometimes you make no money because they damage the well. So they take um, an insurance on the well for $10,000, right? But it costs $100,000 to fill it back in. So they just forfeit on it. The company forfeit, they lose 10,000 to the town. Um, so that's in Mariana. Um, this used to be the old mine. So Mariana was actually the first city to have plumbing, to have um, to have electricity. You know, it was it was a, the mecca of coal mining in Pennsylvania. Um, even the president, when he was campaigning in the 1940, no 30s, came and paid it a visit. But what happened to? But now it's a shell of its old beautiful history. Um, and and for like when I was they were showing me the old mine entrance and I looked around and this engine block was sitting there bleeding and, and all the wise men and the sheeps like surrounding it as if, you know, I mean, like it says enough, 
like the, the the history of this town and that's what really like if it sums it up like this is what these towns are they're shells of themselves and um and all these wise men around it um you know and there is like an opioid you know epidemic like um in on a lot of these towns but i don't really want to focus on it so much but this image showed to me because like there is a cry for help there right and there is also like saying these places are having a problem with this but they don't have the resources to 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 solve it um and that's like to me it's an important thing because i you know my family had problems with uh, these issues so uh, it's always for me it's important like when i see things that i can relate to or my family had proud you know have these things um i you know i bring them into my work um this image of um this man um we you know he he introduced me to a lot of folks but w through conversation um i was like hey uh, you know he, he first you know they got to get to know you and he's like you know i have a son and my wife died um from open heart surgery a year ago and um and i was like look uh you know i'm working on this story and he's like so he 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 brought his son to meet me and he was i wanted you know to photograph them and um and i got these photos and to me it's an emotional thing because after i took the photos of him in a month he passed away you know from from you know a heroin overdose right but but that's not the story is about, but the story is about this beautiful human being that I get to give his family a beautiful photographs. And I think that's what artists and photographers are meant to do is that, you know, um, we record our time, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's important. Um, this man as well, you know, um, he worked in the city for so long in that town, but they're getting sick because there's a lot of metal particles are getting released into the air beside chemical particles, beside noise and sound pollution into this town. And what makes this town unique, usually when you build a fracking site is above land, right? Like when you put, build a pad. Well, what this town is, the town is actually on top of a hill. So the pad is underneath. So they do have a sound barrier as it was instructed to have but the barrier cannot block the sound because the town sits high. So everything blows upward into the city, into the town. And, um, and he'd been diagnosed, you know, with um, muscle deterioration, a loss and cancer, you know, and, um, and they don't have the power to, to, to fix these issues. Um, when I photographed about 20 families in this 70 family town, mm -hmm. A lot of them had the same symptoms, you know, nosebleed, headaches, um, loss of appetite, but a lot of them don't talk to one another, you know? So for me, that's when investigative journalism comes in, right? So you start knocking on doors and you say, hey, um, you don't tell them the neighbor said they had these symptoms, right? So you start asking them questions about like, are you, you know, are, uh, and do you have any health concerns? Or, and they all repeat the same exact thing across um, uh, this image is like, this has actually been my contact point throughout the whole story there. That's like, you know, um, a beautiful human being, a very unique um, character because, you know, um, not afraid to talk to the companies, not afraid of the city council, you know, um, and it's always, you know, um, and we both dress the same way in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we just had our own sense of fashion, but I wanted to share that as well, right? Like there's these things to us. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. And um, are, are these primarily um, people that, um, I, wa I wonder why they don't talk to each other. I mean, I, I find that very interesting. Um, because everybody know each other for so long. They lived in the same communities um, forever. I mean, what I mean, don't talk to each other about their pride. They're proud about like their, um, they don't share their struggles. They don't say I'm sick. They share, they talk about other things, right? But they don't, don't talk about health issues. They don't talk about those stuff till I come in and I start connecting the dots between people, right? Um, but that's the reality of it is sometimes they just keep to themselves. They just want to work um, and they, you know, they just want to live and they don't, they're more concerned about like pain because their bills are up there like, through the roof, you know, even though they own their homes, but the property, now you buy a home there for five grand, a four bedroom, five bedroom home, because nobody want to live there. So they're, they're fighting for survival. They're fighting to exist. 
but at the same time is that I wanted to show the human side of it. Then we can, I can come back in with all the technical, you know, images like to, to support that what we're talking about. Um, the man on the, in the choir, in the, the preacher in the back is the mayor, the former mayor of the town. Um, he was a very outspoken person against um, the company. And the company made sure he, get, um, he loses his seat, you know, um, because that's what happened. These companies are so strong. They basically just replace a whole city council with a whole new city council. It, it, that, so, you know, he fought, he was trying to keep the town on the registry as a historical site, but within enough power, you know, with enough funding from the shell companies or the gas companies, they actually now can, um, can um, what's the word I'm looking for? They can set up or they can prep on the on this little town that cannot afford to fix their own road. Right, they can prey upon people. Right. Oh. Um, so, so which of these images, Hussam, would you like us to bring up? Because this is uh, quite. Um, no. I, I think I would love to the image of the two couple. Um, to me, that's a beautiful one. Or even this one. Um, uh, to me, this image. Um, yeah, like this one. I love this image. Is because. Um, there is that moment, um, like how, so I went there, I met the people and I got to take this photo within half an hour of them, you know, um, being comfortable enough with me, um, you know, and like, uh, I went to their home, I knocked on the door, they're expecting a baby. Um, and, and I just, you know, started talking, telling them what about what to do and stuff. And I said, look, I'm documenting this town. Would you be willing to be part of this? And they said, yes, you know, so automatically, like, th th they're still young, they love each other very much, um, they're having a baby, and and it was like slowly, you know, they gravitating, like they were standing each other, and I just like, my idea sometimes is like to pretend I'm not paying as attention, you know, to let them have that little moment between them, that little love moment, silly moment, intimate moment, you know, because those moments sometimes in front of the camera are ephemeral, right, they come and they go, and I want to capture that as, 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 um, when I see it right away. So when I see it, I just like, you know, um, work with it right off the bat. So that image to me is like, it showed the love for one another, even in a struggling community, you know, and I, that's the images I want to portray of people. So one of the questions we have in the Q and A, and I encourage um, the audience to ask questions, um, Dan McKinney, he's talking about um, your use of the camera, your, your use of flash. Yeah. Uh, he says the most doc photographers won't use a flash because they want to keep things natural. Because yeah. I noticed well, that Wassam often uses the flash. What is your philosophy regarding the light? Oh, I love flash. I mean, that's my whole thing. So I, so, but that's when like art and journalism mixed up, right? Because those old guards of um, journalism, right? They're like, you can't use flash, but they corrupt the image, you know? Or, or they use film, but they develop in the dark room and they, and they like, um, you know, change it up, the contrast or, you know, brighten it. Like they, so they do, so it's the same methods. Like I just rather not, you know, instead of spending hours in the dark room, to me, the reason I use flash, it's just an aesthetic thing. Um, I like my images to have like, um, I, I like my, like the person I'm photographing to, to separate from the background. You know, I like to give them their own space because to me, the background as is, is, is important as the person that's in the space. So I want them to have like, you know, equal value at times. And sometimes is the person in the image have more value instead of I blend them into the background and they just fade away. I don't want people to fade away in my work. I want people to stand out in my work. So how, how did you um, develop this relationship with the people? Because you, you tend to have um, do you, how do you feel that your nationality helps you with your connection, connecting with others when you're well, out doing your, 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 your uh, stories? Well, one, I talk a lot, if you haven't noticed. So I think that builds great relationships with people because they're curious, you know, I, well, I'm curious about to know about people's lives. I'm curious to know who they are. I'm curious to know everything. And they're just curious. They're like, you're from Iraq and how did you get here and why you're here? and why you want to tell my story, then you just start talking, you know? And, 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 and sometimes you actually have a lot in common with people. Then you, you know what I mean? Like we build these boundaries, but then you, you know, like a lot of us grew up in the same living conditions. A lot of times, a lot of us grew up on like, 
government support at times. A lot of us, you know, had this struggle. A lot of us were raised by a single parent at times. So a lot of these things start a conversation with people because you don't want to come in as a journalist or a documentary photographer and come in stiff, right? Like, I know what's best for you. No, I'm actually there to learn from people. And curiosity is what keeps me, you know, um, working with the work. So I'm always interested in, um, asking more questions and letting people know about me. And there was times I think um, I did a long-term essay in Rosebud, a reservation um, in North Dakota. No, I'm sorry, South Dakota. And, um, and what happened is that I was there for 10 days, but you know, people like, look, you, you, you're saying you're a photographer, you're working on a story, but you've been here over eight days, not taking a single photo. You know what I mean? Because like people want to know about you. And I think that is beautiful to me is that it can go both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of time it shows in my work, like, you know, that whole relationship goes both ways because everybody in these images, I can still have a conversation with still, you know, calling, checking on and like, what's going on? How are things going? Sh should I know something is happening recently? I should be there. So, um, what what attracted you to this? Which one, this image? Yes. Um, because these towns have this beautiful historical, um, you know, history, right? Like this town, um, you know, fought against slavery. It didn't want that. You know, it had the first doctor in this town. Um, they fought against, you know, Nazi Germany. They 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 were part of the civil rights movement. A lot of their people. But now this town is sitting there like collecting dust, you know, it's collecting like these things. And I, I was like looking at this image, like sometimes um, work, an image can say a lot, you don't have to say enough. So this whole town history is actually like they fought for so much, but they're losing more now, right? Like they fought for, for quality, but now equality is not coming their way. Um, but they have hope. They go to church every day. They lead the lives just like the rest of us. Well, they love, they love, yeah, ch church there is king, uh, you know? And that was beautiful, like this, this church, if you, if, if you don't look, you pretty much miss it, um, you I know? This was beautifully captured. Uh, is, this the same, is this the same church that you photographed of the, the uh, people, the deacons standing at the front reading the Bible? Um, um, no, the, their church is beautiful as well. Um, it just, it's just part of the larger series. But this church is actually just tucked away. Um, and you have to like to see in this way, there's a cemetery next to this church. Um, and, the, and the coal company actually forced the cemetery to move so they can expand their, um, their, you know, their uh, production. Um, so. All right. So. Uh, Wassam, is there anything you'd like to tell us about the Appalachia and anything you'd like to tell us about how what your next series is or what how you're expanding upon the migrant workers? Um, you want to talk about what's going on behind you? Um, yes, so this is um, so basically is that um, when I said war and technologies, I'm obsessed always um, with a lot of weapons, the first bombarder was in Libya, second one was on Iraq, you know, so like the history of war and the history of military weapons. I'm always fascinated, like when do they use them first? How do they use them? And a lot of these tools always sometimes get used in agriculture because sometimes, you know, they, they want to maximize the best profit, the best land, the best property they can use um, to grow things. Um, so with the, I have a new a new series actually, but it's very um, very conceptual in the sense it's very documentary in the sense of like the work the investigative part. But I wanted to give it a different conversation, um, a different conversation, and and I wanted to have the voices of the farm workers to be part of this. So this is still work in progress. I'm hoping to get it done by the next month. Um, I don't know if you get to see it, but you know. Um, but still, that's like farm workers. But I always worked on multiple projects at the same time. So this is work about farm workers, but this is a separate story. So while I'm working on those, I take a day off and I continue working on these sometimes, like while I'm out there just to collect it. Yeah, so Agatha has a question. She says, good evening, Wassam. I'd like to know, how do you situate, find yourself between artist and photojournalist? Um, they're both, they both need one another. You know, I, I think that I, I, as much as I love it, I, I think people always afraid of that, right? Like they're afraid um, 
like to mix their greens or like their fruits and vegetables together. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you need both. I think art and journalism is that like they can go exist and, and, and I love that. And that's how I've been operating. They can work together because artists sometimes react after journalism publish a story, right? Like journalists find the story, publish a story, um, you know, writers pick it up, write their thesis, talk about it. Um, artists read a the story, they get inspired by, they create a new body of work from it. But to me, it's like, I want to be the source to my work. Um, I want to tell the story first. I want to be, you know, like on the front line telling these stories as they open and as they come to life. And at the same time is that um, I want to create art out of it. I believe they both can coexist. I believe there is a new um, like avant-garde generation of curators, editors who are actually are um, very aware of, about, uh, aware of how culture and society is changing and art and journalism are actually one, you know, instead of they've both been separated because those old ways are dying. Just like some people saying, you can be an interdisciplinary artist. 20, 30 years ago, yes, that was, but now you're like, you don't do what, you don't paint and photograph and, and, and do audio and do video. Like how is, you know, people can't, like you can't do it, it's you. And don't let nobody say to you, no, you can't be that. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that's true. And uh, photojournalists used to have a, a stigma attached to them. They didn't used to consider it art. And um, no, 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 they get mad. Yeah, I, I love it. You know, I mean, I have journalists friend like, how dare you? I was like, what, what do you mean? How dare you? How dare you? you know, yeah. like, so, um, so, so, so with some, we're going to wind this down here. I want to, is there anything else you'd like to say? I want to thank you for your honesty and candor in these two amazing, amazing series of which um we'll be uh, uh presenting in october do you have anything else you'd like to to say to the audience i'm um no i'm really grateful that the everybody took the time to listen um i'm actually got a couple of projects coming up um, i have a piece at the sf camera auction right now of one of the mariana pieces in the church that's helping a great um, organization in the bay that actually do a lot of um, work for young artists and minorities from my experience. I had a wonderful relationship with them. Um, so I think that's a place to support all the artists on there are amazing. Um, so please support. It's closing today. I think yes. it's closing oh, in yeah. an hour or so. Yeah. Yep. Um, and um, I'm really grateful. I have a few new bodies of work and um, I look forward to sharing my new work. And please, um, if you have, I, if you have, a, like sometimes I don't feel comfortable asking questions in public forums. If you would like to ask, send me an email, um, please, you know, it just, it's on my website. You just click and send me an email and I'm more than happy to answer your question or any advice if you want, which, you know, it might be good, it might not be. But, yeah. Yes, Michelle Branch is actually here now and it's a shout out to SF. It's www.sfcamerawork, S-F-C-A-M-E-R-A-W-O-R-K.org slash auction. And um, I think there's a little bit of time left on it. There's some great work in there. Um, I don't know if my husband's listening or not, but I might just check it out myself. <laughs> but it's a great way to support the arts organization here in the, in the Bay Area. And um, so Wassam, thank you. You're a great inspiration and uh, continuing doing what you're doing. Thank you so much and thank you everybody for taking the time um, to, to be part of this. So thank you. And everybody, please get out and vote, vote early. Um, so thank you. Happy oh, autumn. Yes, please, uh, vote. Huh? I said, please vote. Yes, yes, vote. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye.